drivers that have extra space on their trucks. Frederico, you raised $20 million in Series C funding back in November. What are you planning to do with all that cash? Mm -hmm. um, we raised uh, a total of $35 million since we started the company. Um, basically, what, what we do, or the idea was to rebuild a very old industry like you know, the, 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 the trucking markets globally. Mm -hmm. We started up in Brazil because it's such a large market. It's the third largest uh, trucking market in the world. And the idea was to, to enable the guys that do the job, like the truck drivers, to interact and talk directly with the owner of the freight, um, taking the middle, man, the, the middle man out of the picture. That was the, 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 the concept. And the concept uh, came about because I was traveling by bicycle, yeah. riding a bicycle across Brazil. I, I did it across Latin America and then Europe. And I spent a lot of time with, you know, talking to truckers at truck stops. I became friends with a lot of them. And across Latin America and even Europe, the complaint was, was always the same. We get to do the job, the middleman takes the money, and the market is really inefficient. We are always looking for freight. We are, you know, empty. If we had freight all the time, um, we wouldn't be traveling on the road empty. We would be able to make more money. And even the owner of the freight will pay less money, yeah. and they will get a much better quality job. And I thought, you know, if, if these guys are complaining and, and there are so many guys and they are actually moving the economies, there must be a good business opportunity here. So we built a platform that enables these guys to interact directly with the owner of the freight and we provide freight insurance, we provide the payment gateway, we provide the, the client service for the client. We created a safe environment for everyone to work, you know, together. That's, that was... That's some serious cycling ability. We're not just going to breeze <laughs> past that because you just threw it in there like you were cycling across an entire country, and yeah. that, that takes some serious skill. Tim is also a cyclist as well. Never, I never ridden that far, though. Never, never that far? Yeah. But it's amazing to hear about how this company came to be. I mean, look, you have uh, not necessarily that experience, that background in building up companies, raising capital, and yet here you are using the experience from riding a bike across country and speaking with some of the players in this industry and you, you develop a whole new concept here. And so when you think about that, you know, how hard was it to break through and really kind of try this new element to yourself and, and kind of reinvent yourself perhaps around this? Yeah, thing? well, we never start, we never thought like, you know, let's build a company and let's, you know, like just, you know, connect the world in, in a better way. We, we, we never came across like that. Now, obviously, the mission of the company is to rebuild a very traditional industry, like the trucking industry, and we are talking of large trucks at the beginning. But it was me talking to a lot of people that needed help. I could help them out building a platform, and suddenly we got to 250,000 trucks. Um, you know, the company starts, like, getting a lot of revenue, which is, went through, you know, hundreds of millions in revenue. And then, you know, top-tier investors came talking to us and said, look, you know, we, we can give you money and we can, we can create a, a good company out of this. So, you know, I met the investors here in, in, in the States. They, they, they gave us the money. They helped me out to, to build the company, to build the team around the network of trucks that we had. And it just became a company. But I, I wasn't experienced on raising money. I wasn't experienced on trucking. I learned about trucking and the problems of trucking because I was talking to people on, on, on the road. And so it, it's kind of like, I will say, like luck. Mm -hmm. But also it came about, you know, trying to help a lot of people that need help. And that's, you know, by solving a problem, sometimes you create a business. Um, and we started, you know, I could have started in the States, right. in Europe. Um, we decided Brazil because I, I, I always look at Chuck Ma, you know, from, from Alibaba. Yes. And, and, and I remember the, 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 there, is a, there is a sentence that he created for his team when eBay was entering China. And he said to his team, look, eBay is a shark in the ocean, and we are a crocodile in the Shanset River. If we fight in the ocean, we are going to lose. But if we fight in the Shanset River, we are going to win. In China, we can incubate a monster and then go outside and basically you know, uh, have a competitive advantage in the world because we are going to be so big, and, and, and the network effects are going are to move very quickly. That's what we are doing in Brazil. We are building, you know, in, in, in a way, I would like to say like we are replicating the Alibaba strategy of going into emerging markets that, that have big, big problems and, and emerging markets need innovation today. So we are able to bring this innovation into an emerging market, a large domestic economy, and then we are going to grow. Uh, we are already very, like, you know, if, if, if I compare our, our business with, with international equivalents, I right. would say, you know, we have a parallel technology and we have massive scale already. Well, speaking of technology, I mean, Uber is working on self-driving trucks. They're already on the road right now. Tesla has uh, plans to, to bring out electric and self-driving autonomous trucks. How does that play into your business? 
Well, we have 250,000 trucks. Um, we are compiling information on real time every single day. We have millions of data points that are. But do you think in, in five, ten years, those, those trucks will be replaced? Those, those people driving the trucks will be replaced? Yeah, um, well, basically, it's going to be like if you buy an apartment and you rent it out, you're going to be able to buy a truck and put it in a network. Uber, you, you mentioned Uber, they have Uber Freight now. So right. they are they're doing basically a similar model to ours in the United States. Um, and, and, and obviously, when, when the self-driving trucks came, you know, to the, 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 the technology becomes available, um, those trucks are going to be added into a network of, of freights and trucks. And the same is going to happen in Brazil and the rest of the world. And rather than driving a truck, you will be able to just leave your truck in the network and do something else with your time. Rather than working five, five days a week, now people are going to work one day a week. But, you know, people are going to uh, are going to find something to do anyway. So I guess the other side to that is what happens when some of these trucking companies that have been known to operate out of a certain region, they get certain tax benefits from those regions because their operating or their headquarters is, is based in that area, and they get certain incentives, and that trickles down because they're able to bring on a certain amount of employees that stick underneath of them. Or in Tim's case, if they do go fully autonomous and the driver is not in the the picture, then that takes out the overhead that they've got to worry about. So what happens in the regulatory space, I, I suppose, when you have a lot of new truckers that want to do the Uber type of model and they can then rent out some of the space, but at the same time, how do you classify them and their licensing um, and how do you keep from ruffling the feathers of some of these other major entities and corporations that have operated in the space over years as well who are getting these incentives? Yeah, I, I, I think regulation will have to adapt mm -hmm. and people will have to adapt to, 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 to new realities. Uh, the technology cannot be stopped and it should not be stopped. If, if, if you look at what, what is happening, let's, let's use Brazil as an example. Sure. We have trucks, big, big trucks running empty 40% of the time. That means that the truckers are deadheading, meaning like, you know, they, are, they, they can drive very quickly because they, they, they have no loads inside the truck. That means that the trucker goes really quickly heading back home because they know there is freight at home. Right. Uh, the truck is not making a lot of money because they are going one way with freight, the other way without freight. The consequence of that is that you are driving very old trucks, up to 20 years old. Uh, you are driving the truck quickly. The driver is not sleeping very well. And the consequence is contamination and the consequence is accidents, right. and those accidents are impacting not only the truck driver, but any family that goes into a road with, with a car. So technology is gonna enable you know, less traffic jams, less contamination, and the truckers that, that, that you know, they are driving a truck or buy a cell, uh, an autonomous truck, at the end of the day, are gonna be able to make more money, right. and probably less work, less work less and make more money at the end of the day. We're going to have to leave things there for today. But thank you so much for joining us thank here you. on Cheddar. That's Federico Vega, co-founder and CEO of Cargo X, joining us here today.